Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 49th virtual YMCA Education Series program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I'm a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. This evening's presentation, entitled, What is Spinal Stenosis?, is being recorded so that you will be able to revisit it again. Please feel free to view it and tell your family and friends about it so that they too can view it once it is posted on the IBJI and NSYMCA websites. Chances are you're here tonight because you or someone you care about is dealing with spinal stenosis, a condition that occurs when the spaces within the spine narrow and put pressure on the spinal cord. These tightened spaces can cause the spinal cord or nerves to compress and become irritated, resulting in back pain, sciatica, limb numbness, weakness, and nerve pain. Tonight, Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's Craig Forsthoffel, MD, will help us understand more about the symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment options for spinal stenosis. Dr. Forsthoffel is a fellowship-trained board-eligible orthopedic spine surgeon specializing in complex adult and pediatric spine conditions. Before pursuing his medical education, Dr. Forsthoffel served in the United States Marine Corps and deployed twice overseas as an infantryman. Thank you for your service, Dr. Forstoffel. He then attended Colorado State University where he double majored in chemistry and biomedical sciences. Following his undergraduate education in Colorado, Dr. Forstoffel returned to his home state of Illinois and completed both medical school and his orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Illinois. Dr. Forsthoffel then received his fellowship training in complex spinal deformity at Johns Hopkins University. During his residency and fellowship, he also completed multiple research projects that have contributed to the field of spine surgery. With IBJI, Dr. Forsthoffel works out of the Displains and Morton Grove offices and specializes in scoliosis, revision spine surgery, spinal deformity surgery, cervical myelopathy, pediatric spine conditions, and of course, lumbar spinal stenosis. Dr. Forsthoffel enjoys the complexity of the spine and delving deep to understand the conditions that cause pain and disability. He appreciates the challenge of determining the proper diagnosis and finds satisfaction when his patients experience improvement in their pain, function, and appearance. He believes in taking a conservative approach because it is his belief that many conditions can be successfully treated without surgery. Through a collaborative and holistic approach with his patients, Dr. Forsthoffel can provide individualized care that satisfies his patient's goals. And even when pursuing surgical options, he uses the least invasive, safest, and most effective surgery to meet his patient's needs. By employing multiple advanced spine surgical techniques, which include endoscopy, minimally invasive surgery, robotic-assisted spine surgery, complex osteotomies, and deformity corrections, he addresses his desire to reduce surgical-related pain and to enable his patients to return home on the same day as surgery whenever possible. All of the Google reviews of Dr. Forsthoffel that I found gave him five stars. And last month, his patient Laura's review stated, Dr. Forsthoffel was amazing. He was able to uncover the reason behind my chronic back pain immediately and put me on a treatment plan right away. He is professional and considerate. He took his time to listen and made me feel secure about his diagnosis. I am so glad I was able to meet with him and I will wreck him to my friends and family for sure. During Dr. Forstoffel's presentation this evening, you might find that you have questions for him, which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. Simply type your questions into the question section on your screen and I will receive them and relay them to Dr. Forstoffel immediately following his presentation. I do ask that you please keep your questions general as Dr. Forsthoffel will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. If you do have self-specific questions, please contact Dr. Forsthoffel via one of the options that will be listed on the slide shown during the question and answer program of, the port of this evening's presentation. One last thing before I turn the evening over to Dr. Forsthoffel, please mark your calendar for our next IBJI and YMCA Education Series program on Tuesday, March 19th at 7 p.m. Dr. William Vitello will cover the top and common causes of hand pain. Thank you again for joining us tonight, and thank you, Dr. Craig Forsthoffel, for your time and effort in putting together this program to teach us about spinal stenosis. Dr. Forsthoffel, please take it from here. 
Here, can you see that? Uh, yes, we can. All right, All right. well done. Sorry for the delay. So uh, we'll get started now. So my name is Dr. Forrest Offlin, one of the spine surgeons at IBJI, and I'm going to talk to you guys about spinal stenosis. And I'm going to try and cover this pretty broad topic um, in the short period of time that we have and cover some of the nuts and bolts when it comes to the diagnosis, symptoms, treatment, and outcomes with this condition. So what is spinal stenosis? First off, it's snaring of the space for the nerve roots in the spinal canal and the foramina where the nerve roots come out the side of the spinal canal. And this can occur anywhere in the spinal cord, whether it's in the neck or the cervical spine, the mid back or the thoracic spine or the lumbar spine, which is the lower back. But it's most commonly seen in the lumbar spine because of the extent of arthritis people have developed in their lumbar spine over the span of their lives. And it's most commonly seen in patients who are over the age of 65, mainly because it takes many years to develop enough arthritis to develop stenosis. So the best way to understand how stenosis develops is to get a good look at the anatomy. And I like this diagram a lot because it divides what is considered a normal lumbar spine or, lum any, or actually a vertebrae anywhere in the lumbar uh, spine, but this is an example of the lumbar spine. And it also exemplifies the changes that you see with arthritis that leads to stenosis. And on the left, you can see right here, this is the intervertebral disc that has a nucleus pulposus. And it's wrapped around, or there's a annulus fibrosis that wraps around it, which is the tough outer coating of the disc. And then in the middle here, there's an actual spinal canal where all the nerve roots exist. And they come out of the side of the spinal canal in these foramina called the neuroforamina. And you can see that there's an area where they can get pinched here. It's a very tight corner that they take to get out of the spinal column and out to the rest of the body. And then here is the facet joint, and this is a shingle-like joint that acts to check rein the, the remaining vertebra above and below into the stable position on the spinal column. And this is an area where arthritis can develop, and that can gr the arthritis can actually grow or cause the bone to overgrow into the spinal canal and also into the foramina causing stenosis. And then as aging occurs and the discs wear out, there can be bulging of the discs into the foramina and actually into the spinal canal itself. And in some cases, the annulus or the tough outer coating can tear and cause a piece of the disc to actually herniate, which we've all probably heard of at one point in our lives. Now, the most common cause, like I've mentioned, is arthritis. And we often cause, call arthritis in the spine spondylosis, but it's essentially the same thing. And arthritis isn't necessarily a disease process. I tend to think of it more as aging, natural aging. And some people develop that a little bit sooner than others, but it's ultimately something we see in everyone as they get older. And I, I commonly compare it to, you know, skin changes or hair changes as people get older. You get your skin wrinkles, your, your hair turns gray, well, your spine gets arthritis or spondylosis. And that's a very common cause of stenosis. And there's other causes such as instability, which is also known as spondylolisthesis, where one vertebra actually slips in front of the other. And I have an example of that in the next slide. And then disc herniations. And that's something that can cause acute stenosis and sciatica type pain in a very quick manner, often resulting from people picking up a heavy item with their lumbar spine arched. Tumors can also cause stenosis, it's pretty rare, um, but it's, a, it's still seen quite often. Uh, I actually had a patient recently that developed lymphoma and had stenosis symptoms, which was a pretty surprising finding. But also synovial facet cysts can grow, and they're not technically tumors, but they can have a, a mass effect that develops rather quickly. And then fractures, these are less common and typically the presenting sign symptom will be back pain after a trauma, but it can also present with stenosis symptoms in addition to the back pain from the injury. And so this is an example of spondylolisthesis, and this is an x-ray. On the left side, you can see that this is a plain x-ray looking at this lumbar spine from the side, and this is L5, L4, L3, L2, and L1. And this is the sacrum, and here on the side is the actual skin on their back. And you can see here the L4 vertebra is actually slipped in front of the L5 vertebra. And when that happens, it can cause stenosis. 
And here you can see, and this is the same person's MRI, and this is the space where the spinal canal is, where the nerve roots and the spinal cord are, exist. And you can see right here at L4, everything gets squished. And that person would be experiencing pretty significant pain related to that. And I'm gonna go over pretty soon what kind of symptoms you can expect to experience when this happens. So there are some risk factors in developing uh, uh, spinal stenosis. The big one being age. Everybody can develop arthritis as they get older. And the older you get, the more arthritis you develop. And the more arthritis you develop, the more likely you're developing stenosis. But there are other factors that can contribute to that. And one of them is having a higher body weight. That actually puts more stress on the discs over time and the facet joints and can accelerate the arthritic changes. The other thing is having spinal deformity, so scoliosis. Those patients can develop progressive arthritic changes in their spine at a faster rate than those without scoliosis. Not always, but typically from what I've seen. And then genetics. Basically, uh, I like to think about genetics being like the, uh, the, tire, the mileage on the tires of your discs and your facet joints. And some people are born with higher mileage in their, joint, uh, their discs and facet joints than others. And that's something we just can't control, and, but something to take into consideration. So when it comes to the symptoms people typically experience, it's usually a claudication or pain symptom that usually starts in the buttock region and sometimes radiates down into the legs. But even many people have stenosis on MRI, on MRI, they may not have symptoms. Not everybody's symptomatic from this. And if you're not having symptoms, there's no need to do anything about it. I only treat it when there's uh, a person experiencing pain from this. But claudication is probably the most common thing people experience. And that is buttock pain that's worse when standing or walking for a prolonged distance but often can cause radicular pain, which is also known as sciatica. Um, it's, a, it's essentially the same thing where you have shooting pain that goes down into your leg and that correlates with a specific nerve root or set of nerve roots that are affected. And the reason why I put this diagram here is you can see that there's certain areas where nerves are more or less targeted to, depending on where it comes off in the spinal canal. And you can see depending on which nerve is being pinched, there can be associated pain in that region of the leg. So then additionally, myelopathy can occur. That usually is seen at a spinal cord level, and that would be the neck or the lum, uh, thoracic spine. And that actually presents as actual spinal cord damage. And I'll explain a little more of that, but I won't get in too much detail because that is an, a, a whole nother talk in and of itself. So claudication, like I mentioned, it's the leg cramping and pain with activity. It's usually a predictable amount of activity that typically decreases over time. And what I mean by that is people will get a predictable amount of pain after walking a set distance, and they've noticed that this distance decreases over time. And what people tend to notice is they get less active because of how much pain they experience. But when they go to the grocery store, they may not have that much pain at all because they can lean over a shopping cart and it improves their ability to walk longer distances. And that's actually a phenomenon known as a shopping cart sign because leaning forward or flexing your lumbar spine can actually expand the, dis the space in the spinal canal, giving your nerve roots more space. And additionally, you can people have noticed weakness in their legs as, as a result of the stenosis. And then sitting or standing, uh, sta uh, sitting down improves their symptoms as well. And then myelopathy, I'm going to briefly touch on this because this is a whole nother beast of a topic, but this is when the spinal cord is actually being pinched from stenosis in very similar fashion that can happen in the lower lumbar spine. But this can actually result in clumsiness in the hands because the, the brain is no longer communicating well with your, your muscles and your hands in it that control fine motor movements. And so people typically complain or, or experience dropping items frequently, or they're not able to button their shirts or feed themselves with chopsticks or forks. And they've also noticed that their gait has become a little sloppy and they fall over frequently. And then in late stages, they become incontinent. But we will, maybe some other time, I'll talk a little more about that in a, in a different talk. Um, but diagnosing spinal stenosis is primarily done through a history and physical, taking a good look at your, your symptoms, 
what has been done, and looking at what kind of motor function and sensation function is still present in your in your in, on your physical exam. X-rays are incredibly important, mainly to see if there's any abnormalities in spinal alignment, such as a deformity like scoliosis, or if there was a spondylolisthesis, like I mentioned before. MRI is a very reliable study to detect, detect and diagnose spinal stenosis, um, but it's not usually done initially on, on a first encounter unless there's something concerning uh, from the history or physical examination. I often perform CTs if I'm planning on surgery or if there's something that prevents me from getting an MRI, I can do a CT with a myelogram. And the myelogram is basically where we inject dye into the epidural in, or into the intradural space and gives me an idea of where stenosis is without having to expose the patient to a magnet. And that's typically in people who have spinal cord stimulators or pacemaker or they've had a previous lumbar fusion and they have stainless steel implants that really distort the MRI uh, interpretation. And then EMGs are uh, electromyographies, which are needle tests where we basically detect how well the nerves are functioning. I don't often do that for stenosis, but it's something that I do when I have, uh, I, I'm unsure of the diagnosis and I want to tease out some other possibilities, but it's also something that I sometimes use and uh, it's been described. So treatment, I've non-surgical treatment is actually incredibly successful in, in the vast majority of pa patients experiencing spinal stenosis. It's got a success rate of nearly 95%. And this typically consists of physical therapy, focusing on core strengthening, aerobic conditioning to en enhance their endurance when it comes to their claudicatory symptoms, as well as stretching protocols, specifically working on gluteus, and hamstring stretching, and then gait and balance training, especially if they have myelopathy symptoms. I often prescribe medications, and my favorite are anti-inflammatory medications. Unfortunately, not everybody can take those, but when they can, I prefer the long-acting, powerful ones, such as diclofenac and meloxicam. And then if they have very severe radicular pain, I often prescribe steroids, which can be very helpful with this, but unfortunately, it only lasts six days. So using the NSAIDs, or which is also known as ibuprofen and uh, an Aleve, uh, in combination with the steroids can be very effective. I often give gabapentin, which um, is also known as Neurontin, but it's a, it's a special medication that actually decreases the irritability of the nerve, so you don't have as much nerve-related pain, especially numbness and tingling. And then combining Tylenol with your anti-inflammatories has been shown to be very effective in this. And people with muscle spasm related pain can benefit from muscle relaxers. Unfortunately, muscle relaxers do have the side effect of uh, sedation or drowsiness. So I often only recommend those to be taken at night before bed. Uh, other non-surgical treatment options are epidural injections, which I'm a very big fan of. I do not administer those, but we have very, very good pain doctors at IBJI that I send a lot of my patients to. And these can be very good tools to help with this sort of pain when the therapy and the medications don't work as well as we hope. Now, with therapy, epidural injections, and all of these medications that I often prescribe that I know are very effective at treating the symptoms, it never gets rid of the stenosis. And that's something that's, you know, a little unusual to that you would think, but the, the way I look at it is the stenosis makes the nerves irritable. And so, if the medications are able and the therapy are able to decrease the irritation of the nerves, the stenosis is not so much of a problem in the function from in your patient in the fun, your function from a day-to-day -day -day basis. But the the stenosis may cause flare-ups from time to time that can be easily managed with another course of medications and therapy. I usually only recommend surgery when non-operative treatment hasn't been ineffective for three to six months and it's causing significant disability and this is where the part of the job for me gets really fun and we talk about lots of different techniques and and things to consider when when doing these surgeries but ultimately it's either a decompression or a decompression infusion and the decompression is basically where we take pressure off the nerve roots 
the classic technique is a laminectomy or some sort of a laminectomy where you remove bone in the back of the spinal canal and open up the space where the nerve roots exist. And we don't have to replace that space with anything. Oftentimes it just scars over and there's plenty of space for the nerve roots and spinal cord to, to exist and it doesn't cause any long-term consequences. But sometimes a fusion is ne necessary and in a lot of cases it's needed, especially in, when there's uh, instability. And both of these decompression or decompression and fusion can be done with minimally invasive surgical techniques but I'm gonna talk a little more about all that in a, in a few slides. And then there's some new tech, uh, some other techniques called vertiflex and coflex, which are these interspinous process uh, spacers. I don't perform those, but I know some colleagues of mine who do, and they're, they're good tools for certain uh, pathology, uh, but I don't think it's a good fit for everyone. Now, this is an example of a lumbar spine that had undergone a fusion. Basically, we, when, uh, when we do this, we take the lamina off at the affected vertebra and open up the space and we put pedicle screws across this piece of bone that goes into the vertebral body and at multiple levels and connect them with a rod in the back. And then I actually did inner body fusions here at both of these levels to increase the space between the two bones and, and enhance the fusion rate. And so, when we perform decide to perform fusions, it's most commonly performed for instability, like I mentioned before, spondylolisthesis, because the instability in of itself contributes to the stenosis, but also leaving the instability unaddressed after a decompression can actually make the spondylolisthesis worse. Not in all cases, but in most cases. And so in, in, when there is a spondylolisthesis associated with stenosis, typically the recommendation is to do a fusion, but it's decided on a case-by-case case basis. When there's a significant deformity contributing to the stenosis, there's typically a, good, a better outcome when we do a fusion, but not always. And then if there's significant mechanical axial back pain, from disc degeneration associated with their symptoms, doing a fusion can help prevent the, uh, the progressive back pain. And that is not always reliably treated with a fusion, but typically the results in good in 70% of patients. So when it comes to these inner body fusions, like I gave an example of before, the reason why these are very effective is it actually causes something in, called indirect decompression where we actually open up the foramina by jacking open the disc space here between the two vertebra. And then it also improves the, the uh, fusion rates and it also can improve the sagittal plane alignment where there's supposed to be this nice curve in your lower back by adding these spacers and you can recreate that lordosis which is that natural curve in the lower back that's not always needed in everybody but in some patients that's that part of the uh, pathology which is necessary to address and then when we're performing these inner body fusions there's a whole lot of cool techniques with different uh, devices that we use for this Ultimately, the decision on whether to go from the front of the spine, from an oblique angle to the spine, from a lateral position, directly from the side of the spine or from the back, is dependent on the surgeon's technique comfort level, as well as the pathology and the goals of the surgery. But ultimately, the outcome is typically the same as long as the goals of surgery are met, which is stabilizing the spinal column and decompressing the, the nerves that are uh, have experiencing stenosis. And then to sort of quickly touch on minimally invasive surgery, this is using special techniques that require small incisions to achieve the goals of surgery. And it's not necessarily entirely a technique, but it's more of a philosophy of surgery. We're doing the least amount of surgery and also the, the technique with the least amount of invasiveness to achieve the goals of surgery is what I consider to be a, a minimally invasive um, thought process to, to treat the stenosis symptoms. And the advantages of minimally invasive surgery are smaller incisions, less soft tissue disruption, which can maintain some of the stability of the spinal column. There's typically lower blood loss and less immediate post-op pain, 
But long term, it's typically the res the results are the same as as your traditional techniques, with the drawbacks of being the uh, there could be some residual stenosis, which may be a result of incompletely decompressing the neural elements. But that's that's not as that's not as commonly uh, seen as it was many many years ago, and it's also difficult to address multiple levels using minimally invasive techniques, from my experience. So. When it comes to treating spinal stenosis, non-surgical treatment is very effective, and it can result in pain relief that's greater than 50% than the, the most severe of the symptoms. Um, and what I typically tell people is when you have stenosis that's pretty severe, uh, the, the physical therapy is not designed to completely get rid of your pain, but get it to a point where it's acceptable. Or comfortable so that you can perform your your normal activities but surgery has been found to yield greater pain relief and improved function than non-surgical treatment but it's not necessary in everybody with stenosis there is risks that come with surgery and i think when it comes to performing the surgery the the there needs to be an at least some rational for uh rationale for exposing the patient to the risk of surgery uh for their improvement function and then there's also been some new studies that have shown that there could potentially be mortality benefits with surgical treatment, but I, I'm not sure if I 100% believe that. It could be a function of the improved activity levels after decompression, but that's still up for debate. So that's probably a lot to digest, but that's all I have as far as my discussion about spinal stenosis and the diagnosis and treatments options for that. If anybody has questions i'm happy to answer those now excellent all right hello again hey. okay so here are some questions that came in even before your program dr forstoffel all right. um, the first group of questions is um have you ever performed a procedure on cervical stenosis without using hardware in the neck and was it successful uh, yeah, I've done foraminotomies for uh, foraminal stenosis. Um, when it comes to hardware, it just depends on what you mean by that. If it's a fusion, yes, I've done surgeries where I've decompressed the spinal cord, um, where it's it's called a laminoplasty, where we basically wedge open the lamina in the back instead of completely removing it. But I mm -hmm. have to use these tiny little plates made out of titanium. The goal of that surgery is to decompress the spinal cord, but also allow for range of motion. It's a non-fusion operation. It's actually one of my favorites to perform. Um, currently seeing if we could make them out of carbon fiber to make them less MRI, uh, or to make them have less interference with MRI scans, mm -hmm. uh, but that's something that we'll probably see in the future. Cool. Cool. So it sounds like you said that would improve range of motion so that the patient would be able to turn their neck to the side, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. So awesome. like, typically after a fusion, that's one of the drawbacks is you lose your range of motion. And, and there's mm -hmm. this consequence called adjacent segment disease, where once you fuse levels in your neck, the levels above were, that were not fused can wear out faster. And then that, that makes sense. make you at risk for having more surgery down the road. And so doing these motion preservation surgeries can have a lasting benefit by avoiding potential repeat operations. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'm glad I I'm glad I asked. So great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for the question. Okay. Um, Jack says, I'm a lifelong triathlete and have pulled way back on tennis and running because of my stenosis. How can I determine what activities I can and cannot do, and if I hurt myself, am I doing more damage, or can I just back off? Well, it depends on what kind of activities you're doing. If it's running, typically as you get older, running has a lot of high impact on the discs, which if there's disc pathology contributing to the stenosis, that may not be the best. But I am a very big fan of doing aerobic exercises, so I've typically seen people being able to do biking exercises, even if they have bad stenosis, naturally because you're leaning forward in a bike that opens up the spinal canal and it's not placing a lot of impact activities directly on the on the discs. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm going to get to the questions that have been coming in this evening now. Um, 
how long does surgery, let's see, he said what kind of surgery it was, um, stenosis surgery on L3, 4, and 5 to release pressure causing chronic sleep and foot and leg cramps. How long was that surgery, would, would it be expected to last? As far as doing the surgery? How, no, would, how long, like if once, it, so someone had the surgery done and they were uh, wondering how long that surgery was expected to sort of give them relief. Well, the, hopefully the, the relief would be permanent uh, unless there's something else that happened that okay. the, the outcome. But if there, if the surgery successfully decompresses the spinal canal and the nerve roots, there should never be any need for it to, to cause restenosis. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there an age at which it is not beneficial to have surgery to try to correct stenosis? Would the age of 80 or older still be okay to have the surgery if the patient is in extreme pain? Yes. I, so it's really the decision for making for performing surgery is on an individual basis. If there is too many medical conditions that make surgery highly unsafe, then I would recommend against surgery. But if I've seen plenty of 90 year olds who are highly active and have stenosis for various reasons, and I, we've operated on them. One of them being a uh, a recent lady who had a meningioma from from uh, and causing spinal cord compression. So it can be very beneficial, but it's it's less common to see it in, in advanced ages like that. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. All right. Are there specific daily exercises that you would recommend for someone diagnosed with spondylolisthesis? I would do a lot of hamstring stretching exercises by stretching your hamstrings you take pressure off your spine you also would work on i would recommend working on core strengthening exercises but i wouldn't do crunches i've always found crunches to be very harsh on the discs especially when there's a spondylolisthesis so okay. doing things like planks and leg raises are very good in those scenarios i would also work on doing a lot of aerobic exercises specifically bicycling stationary bicycling because that actually helps condition the nerves for the uh, against the stenosis. Awesome, great, thank you very much. All right, um, someone asks, how much time uh, would would people need to wait between epidurals for spinal stenosis? It depends. You, they can, you can usually get them up to two weeks spaced out, but I would recommend not getting more than four in a year. So okay. it's one of those things where you get four shots per year. You can use them how you 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 need them, but I, you can't get them more than two weeks sooner or within two weeks of each other. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. And and so someone might get them two weeks apart because that may provide a longer benefit for them if they had one and then one two weeks later. What I've typically seen is you know you get a shot and it didn't really give you the 100 percent pain relief or maybe gave you 30 percent but it did give you something and getting that second shot two weeks later can get you to 80 percent gotcha okay okay great thank you all right someone asks is it better to keep moving when having leg pain I, i'm guessing as opposed to becoming stationary it's always beneficial to keep moving it's it, and I would have one of the things that physical therapy is effective at is to work through the pain and and condition the nerves and your body to adapt to the stenosis so that your walking tolerance can get l longer. It doesn't work in everybody, but most people it does. Now, right. when it comes to stenosis in your lower back and this lumbar spine, work walking past the pain isn't necessarily causing permanent damage it's just pain so that's the only thing that i would i would like to clarify okay okay thank you that makes that's an important clarification all right um someone asked stenosis cause foot numbness mm -hmm. yes it can cause more than foot numbness it can cause entire leg numbness numbness right Great, great. I mean, you, you explained it, but I wanted to make sure that that person understood. Sure, um, yeah. I'm getting a bunch of thank yous, and thank you very much. Very informative. All right. Uh, this person says, let me just see. Uh, you seem to focus a little bit more on the lumbar region this evening. Do these treatments, non-surgical and surgical, also apply to cervical stenosis? 
Yes, it does, but it depends on what kind of stenosis, and that's why it gets a little different when it comes to the cervical and thoracic spine, because when there's myelopathy involved, which means that the stenosis is pinching the actual spinal cord, mm -hmm. that's not something that I, as a surgeon, sit on. I actually am a lot more aggressive at treating myelopathy with surgery because postponing surgery for non-surgical treatment can actually cause permanent spinal cord damage. Wow, okay. That is, that is something that's not in the patient's best interest. If even when I caution them that it can cause permanent damage and they're against it, I, I, I say, hey, it's fine. But knowing that early decompression in those cases can have a drastically improved outcome, I, I just don't recommend waiting on that. Now, if it's stenosis in the foramina alone in the neck, yeah, I definitely send patients for physical therapy and injections and medications, and they actually often get better very quickly. Great, great, that is excellent. All right, if someone has, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to read it and it moved. If someone has arthritis in the lumbar and thoracic parts of their spine with numbness in their leg, is it better to see your office or a neurologist? You, you could see either of us, I'm happy to see, I, I treat from neck all the way down to sacrum. So it doesn't matter if it's in the thoracic spine or the lumbar spine or in the cervical spine, I treat every, everything. Great, okay, thank you. Um, if a person, uh, that was that same one, sorry, they're not cooperating like they usually do for some reason. Okay, um, someone asks, what is microdiscectomy and why would, this be done or not done compared to the other surgeries? Is that a part of stenosis, microdiscectomies? Yes, and that was sort of like a laminectomy, and it's okay. a of a laminectomy. You do take a part of the lamina off. It's not the entire lamina, and you move the nerve roots out of the way to get to the epidural space, and then right there, there'll usually be a piece of disc that's pinching against a nerve root, and you can use special instruments to take out that disc to give the nerve root a little more space. Oh, excellent. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then someone else, and it sounds like you've already kind of said this, but can stenosis be a cause of peripheral neuropathy in the feet? Peripheral neuropathy is a little bit of a different diagnosis. That's usually from a systemic cause like diabetes or some oh. Um, And that's when, when I see a per patient who has symptoms consistent with neuropathy, and they have findings of stenosis in their lumbar spine on an MRI, I'll send them for an EMG to clarify if whether their symptoms are from the neuropathy or truly from their back. Okay. And mainly, I don't want to propose potentially surgical treatment that wouldn't respond to surgical treatment. Gotcha. Okay. And someone else had asked about um, that spinal stenosis showed up on their scans. Um, but they aren't in pain, and they've, they've got some heavy leg feelings um, and some balance instability, like heavy leg from the knee down and balance and instability, uh, and after short periods of walking, they're fatigued and need to rest. And the primary care suggested maybe seeing a vascular surgeon or a vascular specialist. And so the question was sort of like, do I, should I see a vascular specialist? Should I see you? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think you should see both. Because a lot of times vascular claudication, which I probably should have mentioned, uh, but it can actually be very similar in the symptoms as, as neurogenic claudication, which, was, which is what happens with stenosis. Uh, you can get this cramping and pain in your legs that actually improves when you stand up right after walking a certain distance, whereas spinal stenosis, you have to sit down. It's a little bit of a, a, a nuance to differentiate the two, but what I've noticed is people who often develop spinal stenosis also have athero atherosclerosis of their okay. vessels in their legs, and that can cause similar symptoms. Interesting, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next on the agenda, um, sorry, come on. Okay, uh, that was that one. Oh, you talked about different types of exercise being good for you, and someone asks, is yoga a good exercise to assist with spine stretching? It's excellent. 
Excellent. Well, that's a great answer. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, is robotic surgery used for these procedures? Parts of it. There are some people out there that are using robots for placing pedicle screws, which is part of the fusion operation. And they're currently working on robots to do the decompression part where they do the laminectomy. I have not seen there's any difference really when it comes to using robots in spine surgery versus people who are doing it without robots. Got it. Okay, great. Um, thank you. That's very helpful. I've heard about ablation lately. Uh, why would that be used? Someone asks. So ablation. Or I think it's probably when and why. It says way and why, but I think it means when and why. Yeah, that's a good question. So ablation is actually targeted towards a different type of pain in the back. Now the facets, I think I mentioned, is one of those shingle joints in the back of the spine. Those can get arthritis, like I mentioned, and they can contribute to the stenosis, but they are joints just like your hip and your knees. And they can get arthritis, arthritic pain, just like your hip and knee pain, knees, knees can. And when that happens, they can do injections in the facets, just like they do corticosteroid injections in your knees and the hips. And if they respond well to an, uh, an injection in the facets, they can do um, ablations where they basically take a radio frequency device and they zap the nerves that give pain signals from those facet joints. And that can provide like six months of pain relief in some people who have that type of pain. It's not really effective at all for stenosis pain. Okay, got it. Oh, that's very helpful, thank you. All yeah. right, are PRP injections an option for stenosis problems? I would highly recommend against any PRP injections for stenosis. It's not the right kind of pathology. There's some data out there to show it's good for knee and hip pathology, but this is really stenosis and adding PRP in there doesn't really help with the stenosis issue or the gotcha. inflammatory issue. Really, when you do the injections like the epidurals, it's really aimed at taking care of the inflammation that's causing the pain. PRP may actually make that worse because it's supposed wow. to generate a, 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 an inflammatory response in your joints to help heal the joint. And, and inflammation is what causes the pain here and, and a lot of the stenosis. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. All right. What is the recovery time after a fusion and would rehab be required following fusion surgeries? It depends. My typical protocol is after the surgery, no physical therapy, just walking without any bending, lifting more than 10 pounds or twisting for six to eight weeks. And that is to protect the spine to get the fusion to heal. And then after that, depending on how things went after the surgery and where their activity levels are, I, I'll most often send them to physical therapy for an additional eight weeks afterwards. Typical time to recovery is three to six months, depending on how much surgery was involved. And if it's a big surgery, like a scoliosis surgery, it may be up to a year. It's a very large surgery to recover from. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you. That's good to know. And I'm sure you talk that through with all of your patients as you oh, yeah. make that decision. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I spent a lot of time talking to my patients before surgery. Yeah. I And I love that because that an informed patient, you know, can make better decisions with you. Okay. Yes. Let's see. Um, someone says that they have a lot of pain after getting out of bed that subsides after stretching and walking. Um, I, I guess they're wondering maybe could that be a type of stenosis pain? It could. Some people who have bad stenosis have pain at night because when they lay flat in bed, they're extending their backs and that mm -hmm. could cause the stenosis to get worse. Okay. And sometimes they get better pain relief when they sleep upright in a chair. Not everybody, but some people. Okay. It's Got kind it. of hard to tell without you know getting x-rays and an MRI, but I've, I've seen people with that experience that. Okay, thank you. Um, someone asks, could heat help with stenosis pain? Heat, I, honestly, heat or ice can help. I found most people stay heat, taking hot showers or putting hot packs on their the bottom of their back near the buttock region can help with the pain. It's really not going to change the natural uh, the natural history of the disease process, 
or it's not going to help it heal faster. It really just helps manage the pain symptoms or augment the pain sensations. Gotcha, gotcha. So if it's something that's just recurring, 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 maybe it's time to see somebody. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, great. What are your thoughts on chiropractic for spinal stenosis? I it well, if it's in the lumbar spine, I don't. I think it's okay. If you find it to be beneficial, great. I would not recommend chiropractic manipulation or therapy if you have stenosis in your neck or your thoracic spine or your mid-back until you've been evaluated by a spine surgeon because if there's stenosis and they do a manipulation, that can cause a serious problem. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you need to say any more. That, that's very clear. Yeah. All right. What are your thoughts on inversion tables? Inversion tables can be good. Sometimes that it actually expands the height of the discs and can sometimes decrease some of the pain or stenosis associated with that. It's not a permanent fix, but it's more of an alleviator of pain when you have a good uh, flare-up. Got it, got it. And you mentioned exercises for spondylolisthesis. What about for stenosis? Are there particular exercises that you would highly recommend for stenosis in the different parts of your spine? I would recommend the similar exercises, but the main thing is stenosis is adapting to the nerves being pinched. So doing a lot of aerobic exercises or walking tolerance. So getting with the therapists and working on different ways to increasing to increase your walking distance. What I've noticed with a lot of people with stenosis is they can walk maybe one or two blocks before they need to stop because they're in so much pain. Getting into therapy and working with the therapist can really get your tolerance to like maybe four or five blocks before you need to stop to pay for pain. And that can be done with various aerobic exercises. The best one to start with is a stationary bike because it's very easy on your back and it can really get some air, uh, cardiovascular endurance built up. And, and a question for me, the personal trainer, when you say an exercise bike, upright, semi-recumbent, recumbent? I found upright to be better because leaning forward actually opens up the spinal canal. Recumbent, yeah. actually, you know, it doesn't give you as much of that biomechanical benefit, but the, it's still, if you find it to be more comfortable, by all means. Got it, okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, someone asks, would a nerve block help reduce spinal stenosis pain? Yes, if it's if the spinal stenosis pain is causing sciatica, a nerve block would be very helpful. And actually, it's very helpful in diagnostic dilemmas where I'm not sure exactly which nerve root causing your symptoms. So getting nerve blocks and having a positive response from that nerve block by eliminating pain from that single injection can give me a lot of information on what to do next. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. All right, and someone says, okay, so you said biking and yoga can help. Do these exercises have long-term, like multiple days effect on pain and stiffness? Um, so it's, I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's one of those things that you have to do it on a regular basis to get the max. It's not something like I'm gonna do yoga one day and then I'm expecting it to last for like the next five days. You kind of have to commit on a to a, a regular regimen and do yoga maybe every other day or daily, and same with the biking or any sort of exercise program to help keep the stenosis symptoms from coming back. And if they do, they are not as severe as they were when you first experienced them. Great. And that wasn't even a plant because that would <laughs> that's the kind of question I would say, rah rah, right on. So yeah, keep doing it, keep moving, keep doing your yoga, keep riding your bike, because it does help and it can have long-term benefits if you do it regularly. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, okay, this is a very long, um, I'm trying to see if I can find a general question. Uh, it's a very long question, so I think we'll, uh, we'll skip it because it's just too, too long and involved. Um, can using an elliptical help with the pain of numbness and burning? It can, I if you, so the main thing is if you get on the elliptical and you notice it doesn't worsen your pain symptoms, by all means, I'm for it. I just think biomechanically, the way elliptical works is a bit different than how a stationary bike works. It may not be as tolerable when you have spinal stenosis. 
you're typically arching your back, you're twisting your core to, to use an elliptical sometimes, and that can actually make some of these symptoms worse. So if you do do that, I would not do it when you're having an acute flare up. I would wait till you get things calmed down and then you can try an elliptical when your pain's well controlled. Great, that's a great answer, thank you. Okay, um, someone asks, have you performed an X-stop procedure? And I apologize, I don't know what that is, so if that's inappropriate, I apologize for asking. I have not performed an X-stop procedure. I So a lot of those interspinous process spacers procedures, I, I personally don't perform. I have pain management specialists at IBGI that do. So if I think someone's a candidate for that, or if that's something that they're 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 seeking out, I'll just send them to one of my partners who does. I okay. think there are great procedures in certain patients, specifically if you have one or two level disease with a grade one spondylolisthesis and your pain improves with flexion, it's a good procedure. I just think though that the durability of that compared to a laminectomy or a laminectomy infusion is not there. That's just my opinion and from what I've observed. Okay. But if that's something you really want, I will, I'm not gonna tell you no and I'll send you the right guy. Got it, great, thank you. Okay, um, what can you do for chronic headaches from stenosis? So that's usually from the cervical spine. It depends on what kind of headaches they are. A lot of times people who get arthritis in the back of their neck, uh, specifically in the upper cervical spine, can get occipital headaches. That is a tough, tough problem to, to, to treat. I often try facet injections for those. Um, and I send you, I you typically will send patients to a pain management specialist or interventional radiology to try facet blocks to see if that helps with the pain. And most of the time it works. Um, in pretty se severe circumstances, I may try a C2 nerve root block. Um, it's tough to fully, if it's not occipital headaches, it's just general headaches, I would really consider a neuro an, an, uh, an evaluation by a neurologist to see if there's other causes of headaches because okay. the cervical spine as a cause of headaches is more of an exclusion, not the norm. So okay. it's like you've ruled out all other causes of headaches besides occipital, which is the back, which is the yeah. back of yeah. If it's anywhere else, I would say see a neurologist first to see if there's another cause because it's very rare for you to get a headache here when it's from your neck. It's typically the back of your head. Got it, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, do you have any insight on regenerative therapy options? Uh, so what I will say is a lot of very smart people out there are working on regenerative medicine techniques for the discs. Um, we have not found anything reliable. Maybe in the next 10, 20 years, we'll have something. But once the discs start to have our, develop arthritis or what we call degenerative disc disease, it's an irreversible process. And it's really a function of the discs. There's this jelly material like or jelly material called the nucleus propulsus. I mentioned that in one of my slides. Yep. And when people get older, that disc loses its water content. There's these special sugary molecules called proteoglycans that attract lots of water into the disc. And then when those proteoglycans break down, they lose their water content and it turns more from jelly to molasses. And it okay. gets kind of squishy and like a flat tire and it bulges and it causes the nerve roots to get pinched. There's people trying to develop a way to kind of hydrate those discs again, but it's not lasting and it doesn't seem to have the effect we hoped it would have. But maybe we'll have something in the next 15 to 20 years that that can and that can change the ball game when it comes to treating these sorts of conditions. For sure, great, okay, thank you. Drinking more water doesn't help, huh? I wish, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. All right. Can stenosis cause pain and burning sensation only from the knees up? Yes, it can. It depends on what nerve is being pinched, but yes, usually that would be the upper lumbar spine, L2 and L3. Okay. When it's um, past the knee, it's gonna be L4, L5 and S1. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, let's see. Um, 
And someone says, thank you for an informative webinar and discussion. I've recently completed PT and your, your presentation has been incredibly helpful. There's another thank you. Um, let's see. Somebody asked the question that we had already talked about, the upright or recumbent bike. Uh, I have spinal stenosis in L4, L5. Some days I can hardly walk and put weight on my leg. I'm very unsteady and have to use my walker. Physical therapy medication injections have not necessarily worked. What exercises can help me? Well, I would prefer. I would say first of all, I, I, you you may need to come see me if you have done all of that so far. There could be something else we could try, but uh, as far as exercises go, it's the same stuff I mentioned before. Really working on aerobic conditioning. The the pain that limits your activities can get better when you condition your nerves to walk further and further distances. Now that may not be something that lasts over time as the stenosis may get worse, which I okay. often see, but it can have a pretty substantial effect in most people. Great, okay, yeah, I mean, I think that's a real takeaway for people is get your aerobic exercise. It can help with your spinal stenosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, all like right. Someone says, uh, with regard to their spinal stenosis, I'm 47 and my symptoms continue to progress. Is surgery better sooner than when I'm older? Does the age matter? And does arthritis continue to, to progress despite surgery? So it depends on where the stenosis is at. If it's at a spinal cord level, I would say doing the surgery sooner is definitely in your best interest. If it's in the lumbar spine, there is no urgency to doing surgery now versus three to five years from now or 10 years from now. What I have noticed though is that you may lose years of activity as your stenosis gets worse and it holds you back from going on trips or hikes or adventures in your life. And that's the thing is I've seen a lot of people, they get to their retirement and they're ready to go on some big trips that they've been saving up for and then they get some bad stenosis symptoms and they just can't keep up with the plan. So they, uh, it, it can be very inhibitive in that factor. Got it. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. And our person with the long question said, I think I should make an appointment. So thank you, Gail. I think that's a good idea. All right. Um, let's see, you know what, we have hit eight o'clock. Um, so I think I need to let you go because you have been so wonderful in answering so many questions and they just keep flowing in. So thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Greg Forstaffel. What a wonderful presentation, lots of great information. And I think, um, you know, you really shared the willingness to answer the questions for the people. So that really helped to, to get your points across. And um, I think we've got some really great takeaways. So thank you, Dr. Greg Forstaffel. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Have a terrific evening, everybody. And again, thanks for your time, Dr. Forstaffel. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate everybody coming and uh, watching my presentation. Uh, Till next time. And sorry for the uh, little technical difficulty at the beginning. <laughs> no, you, we got it worked out. So thanks again, Dr. Forstoffel. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.